Hello, and welcome to Bridal Cry Ministries. We have the mission of restoring the eternal purpose of God. If you don't know what that means, you're in the right place. If you do know what that means, you know how rare and special it is. So we're glad you're here to join us in sharing the truth and love. Um, just want to say, if you are here, thank you so much. Please like and subscribe uh, for more content and to help this ministry out. If you think that our production quality is a little subpar and bad, we actually agree with you. Um, it's not amazing because we record in the morning and or at night um, in between us being full-time fathers and husbands and business owners. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it, you kind of get what you pay for. And so <laughs> we, we, we do this with the with the uh, the scraps of our time, um, but we are very burdened by this message that God has been instilling in our hearts over the years. And so even though we don't have a lot of time to edit and do all the post-production and, and have the nicest equipment, we really feel the burden to hit record and to get you this content. And so if you believe in this content and if it's ministering to you and or other people, please consider um, donating to us on our website and or joining our Patreon Um team where you can get exclusive content, show notes, some of our behind the scenes kind of scripture notes and things like that. So anyway, today we are going to be talking about four types of Christians. And this list, if you will, was originally coined by A.W. Tozer in his book, The uh, Crucified Life. I shared this post talking about these four types of Christians, and it went absolutely bonanzas viral um, for a lot of different reasons. And I'm going to share that now. There are four types of Christian, the cultural Christian, the carnal Christian, the religious Christian, and the spiritual Christian. Now, cultural Christians aren't actually Christians. They're just people that have taken on that name but are truly just part of the culture. The second is carnal Christian. Carnal Christians have truly encountered the Lord and they've received salvation, but they're driven by the desires and lusts of their flesh. Jesus is their savior, but he's not their Lord. Then you have religious Christians. Now, these are Christians that are ruled more by their self-righteousness than they are by Jesus. They're driven to do good works out of obligation and ritual more so than they are are by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then you have the spiritual Christian. These are Christians that are truly led and governed by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes they'll very much upset the religious Christians because they'll go outside of what the religious Christian believes is the right or wrong things to do because they are being governed by the Holy Spirit, which does not always play friendly with our rules. And so, yes, now granted, one of the reasons why we're doing a podcast and not just a bunch of Instagram reels is because you can't capture the entire sentiment of something in 60 seconds. Very limiting, very frustrating. And so there's a lot of misconceptions that happened with people because they they took the four types of Christians and, and thought that it meant a million different things. And we're going to get into that for a second. Uh, but before we dive into the misconceptions about what the four Christ types of Christians are, and then basically explain that it's deeply biblical and that there is um, there's actually incredible truths that we need to wrestle with, even if they confront our uh, religious and doctrinal paradigms. Um, but Matt, before we dive into all of that, <laughs> you you were kind of there with me during the journey of of this kind of gnarly post. Uh, why do you think this hit such a nerve, and why do you think this triggered so many Christians? Well, I know when we were when we were getting ready to talk about this, Dan, it was really um, it it was helpful for me to start thinking in terms of you know. It doesn't really matter which paradigm of your Christian journey that makes sense to you. The reality is your paradigm will at least have beginning, middle, and end, <laughs> at least somewhat. And so if, if beginning and middle and end exists, then there should be features about beginning that if you could understand those features and the hangups that come with them, then you could actually get some really quality um, perspective on where you need to go next. And that would move you into another phase, another stage. And so I really appreciate what Tozer has. I don't think he's wrong on what he's saying, but depending on, your paradigm, you might might be able to get some different information. And I think it's not just the Tozer's paradigms that we want to talk about. We want to talk about the temple paradigm, which I think has some huge benefits if you can recognize which temple court you're in, the kinds of things that God wants to do to move you to your next court with him. Or you know, we're going to talk about other other another paradigm that's really affected you and I that 
it has value. And w- so I guess what, to answer your question, can feel judgy because yeah. the human heart produces judgment as a standard skill. We don't judge ourselves. <laughs> if we don't judge ourselves. Yeah. Who cares about judging other people? Yeah. Well, let me know if you agree with this statement. I really, um, I've come to experience and believe in myself. I've seen this within myself that, um, there, there is this interesting paradigm where we view salvation and we view our Christian experience as transactional. Now, I don't think anyone would admit to that because most people know the adage, oh yeah, well, no, this is about a relationship with God. It's like, sure, but functionally, we treat it very transactionally. And especially with salvation, we view, oh, I was saved when this happened. And now it's done and it's complete. And those are accurate scriptures, right? So like the telestai, like it's finished, like it was completed. Yes. However, salvation needs to be coupled with sanctification, which is this process of saving um, and deliverance, if that's a better word. But when people view it transactionally and I say, hey, there's four different types, you know, or we just use that kind of language of, well, what do you mean? And no, you're either saved or you're not saved. And if God's not your Lord, he's not your savior. Like there's all these things and it it kind of, um, it it removes the relational journeying. It, it, it removes the, like, like, like John Bunyan's like pilgrim's progress. Like there is a progress Mm. that we are walking down. And during that progress, you're going to encounter all kinds of things and you're going to respond poorly and, and, and good in depending on where you're at. Yeah. Thoughts on that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, if it gets too, um, if, if Christianity gets too all in all out, then there's so many passages that we want to spend time on. There's so many passages that will stop making sense. They'll stop working and you'll just move on or you'll lump them into, Oh, they must mean something else. But the scriptures, you know, when Jesus was talking to the church at Laodicea, a very famous passage, I wish you were hot. I wish you were cold. You're lukewarm. So a Christian can be hot. Christian can be cold. Christian can be lukewarm, right? Like he's talking to you, Christian, Laodicea, you, I wish you were hot. You, you know what I mean? Like if, if we, if we get too much all, so the reason I think that the, that it's easier to be all is because it requires more discernment. It requires and, and judgment gets used as a bad word, but um, 1 Corinthians 11, judge the body rightly, right? 1 Corinthians 6, you guys need to be able to judge among yourselves. The idea is that if you don't have Proverbs wisdom to be able to discern what's really happening in your soul, your soul, forget about everybody else's soul. If you don't have the wisdom to discern your soul, or if you don't have someone who can speak in some discernment into your soul and your journey, then you're stuck with um, out help on what you need to do to get unstuck (laughs) and move forward. Right. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? One of the comments that came up a lot in the threads, and I read every single comment. Um, At first, I was really bothered by them, and then it almost became comical, and then it was like anguish and sadness that there was just so much infighting with the body of Christ. Um, But a lot of people looked at it and said, well, again, like you're trying to classify and pigeonhole people and label them, and you can't be this. And I think we missed the fact that if, if we look at it as a, as a point in time, like this is what I am and all I'm ever going to be, we miss the reality that it's like, well, someone's like, you can't be a carnal Christian and be saved. I'm like, well, perhaps if you persist in carnality, I would say, yes, the fear is, you know, it's going to reveal in the end how, you know, where your loves really went. But in a moment and in a day, I would say that there's moments of carnality and sin and flesh that we need to overcome. And so it's like these four types of Christians, it's like, this is for everybody. In one day, I can experience all four of these types in my own self that I need to overcome. 
I'm not even kidding you. In one day, I'm overcoming carnality. In one day, I'm overcoming religiosity. In another, I'm, I'm trying to fight. For, you know, it's like it's all in here. And a type is someone that through a series of consistent decisions that's characterized by carnality, that's characterized by religious ritualism. That's it's like it's these it's the it's the compilation of all of these decisions over a period of time that's going to define you as one of these. And this was really supposed to be a mirror, like in James. This these labels are supposed to be a mirror. They're, excuse me, they're not labels; they're types. Um, uh, this is supposed to expose to us the inner condition of our heart. Like for those who are willing to say, God, show me if there's any deceitful or hurtful way within me. Why? So that I can come into truth and life. This is to kind of reflect to us, hey, I'm, we're seeing something other than Christ and his perfection. And so, yeah, I think that's the hard part is recognizing like we're, we're journeying towards this. And yes, if you continue in carnality, because that was an art, a thing I actually agreed with people. I'm like, yeah, I would, I would heavily caution people. Be careful how you go, because if you continue in your indulgent lifestyle, like you are going to find yourself further and further away from Christ to the point where he's going to say, I don't even know who you are, even if you began. Now, the language we're using right now, I know is going to upset some people that, you know, have a, this is going to poke at denominational stances and that's fine. Bear with us. We're going to get into some scriptures. <laughs> so first thing I do want to say is that um, the four types of Christians, they're not labels. And this is going into what we were just saying. These are not boxes to define ourselves in. Um, but like James 1, 23, right? Uh, you have first Samuel, like God, we're always looking in the outward appearance of man and God's looking at the heart. And so these are um, descriptions of a characterization of what might be evidence in our behaviors, but God's looking at our heart and he's constantly wooing us. And while we're alive, we have time to repent. We have time to mature and we have time to choose whom we're going to serve. Amen, Matt. Right. And so I would say if anyone says, well, I'm here or I'm there, I don't know where I am. It's like the answer is praise God. You're here right now. And you have a chance to choose to pursue fullness in Christ. And that's which, the whole, and that's the whole that's... point of this. I think that's I think that's exactly the thing though that created the most angst, and I think this is the thing that in, whenever you have these discussions is is like take take that take that fourth Christian that everyone's supposed to be the spiritual Christian. Here's the problem with that: there's gradations within the spiritual Christian. <laughs> <laughs> there's, you know why? This, this is the thing that makes Dan and I really move here, right? The end goal of this thing, the end goal of this thing is that Jesus Christ will inherit a body of people who have completely given themselves over to him. They are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. They are the ones who have um, forsaking all have followed him. They are the one, you know, like there's this quality of submission and loss of self that, that is like the innermost court of the temple that is separate even from the ability to minister to, to God in the inner court, which is separate from the value of, of walking in outer court Christian life, right? Like we're, that's the thing that I think that frustrates us is because we we still want to create these easier boxes. Well, I'm the spiritual Christian, so I'm good. Meanwhile, Jesus Christ says, have you become one with me and your brother? And, and it's like, well, no. Then we still have room to grow. And that's what we really want to spend this channel on is that. And this, this, this four C stuff is, or this four Christian stuff is going to be material that we can use to help get what the paradigm is that Dan and I are really passionate about, which is a Christ oriented relationship based Christianity. Yeah. 
Yeah, and one of the reasons why, I mean, one, this this struck a nerve, and so one, it's, it's clearly deeply held in our hearts. Um, but also, I was telling Matt yesterday, in reading through Jeremiah in the very first chapter, God says that he or like ordained, he called out, he consecrated Jeremiah to tear down and also plant and build. And this is what we talked about with our one of our second episodes, which is if God is going to build something, if he's going to build his true spiritual temple, which is us, he needs to remove idols. He needs to tear down structures that were not there built by him for him so that he can put with a fresh foundation of Christ, truly Christ, and build the temple of living stones. And so there's this reality that all of us need this process within us. Um, I read a commentary, Matt. So sad as I'm as I'm as I'm preparing for Jeremiah, and he, he went on this whole section about how it's really hard to interpret Jeremiah because this is for those people in those times, and how do we apply that to us? It's you know we can't, and so we'll glean something. I was, in my mind, I'm just scratching my head. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I thought the word of God was living and active, and oh my gosh, I was like, I thought the word of God was sharper than a two-edged sword and living and active. Like it's just it was oh. for those people, and so here's the thing: it's like he's right. This was written for those people in that period of time, and it applies to them, and that's one level of analysis, but there's other levels of analysis where this applies to the entire church, and this is a condition of the heart, which is prevalent, pre- excuse me, prevalent through all of time and all of history, like what they experience in the heart conditions and the, and the, and the idols oh, and yeah. all of the issues, it's so much for today, oh, and yeah. I would say radically for today. Well, but 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, he comes out and he says, uh, those stories were written for us. Uh, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were under the cloud, a pastor through the sea, were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and ate the same spiritual food and spiritual drink, the strength from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased, and they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as an example for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters. Da, 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 da. And then, um, I just want to grab the one. Now these things, yeah. Now these things, verse 11, happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So when we're walking, when we're watching the Pharisees, everybody loves blaming the Pharisees, but they're a version of Christian. Everybody loves blaming Adam and Eve. You and I are going through the same challenges that Adam and Eve went through all the time. Everybody likes blaming the Jews that abandoned God. Oh, they didn't have the faith. Everybody loves blaming the Jews that didn't come out of Babylon and move back and rebuild. Right? Like, these are examples of places we can go. And they create paths that we can avoid or walk on or journey or challenges that we must pass progress. Yeah. And this was something that was said to me in my very first day of hermeneutics class. And it's something that I, I think needs to be said because apparently it's, it's a lost concept, but whenever you read a story of a bad person in scripture, assume that it's you assume that you are the, like, like you're not David, you're not Jesus, you're not, like, you are all, you're Samson, you're Delilah, you're, you know what I mean? Like, you, you're, you're Hagar, you know, it's like, yeah, you're, you're Gomer, like, come on, you, you are, you are the bad, the bad, the bad fruit here. Um, we need to assume that we're the ones that need correction, and that if there is a good person in scripture, is there's a glimpse of that, that's Christ. Period, and um, and so yes, so we need help. And again, the the goal is that we are to allow these things to be exposed in us. Of like, wow, I am this Pharisee. I need to make sure that I have. I'm not an empty shell of of, of ritual, but that I have a true and and meaningful relationship with Christ. Like, we need to wrestle with these things and test ourselves to see if we actually are in the Spirit. And that's the whole point of this. And that's that's just the commitment of the crucified life. And that's what the whole book of Tozer is talking about is like the cross. Okay. I will say this and we'll move on to the second point. Um, as Christians, we're really good at celebrating the work of the cross. I was saved past tense and yes. And amen. Christ accomplished a work on the cross and it is finished to tell us die done. Amen. But he invites us into the way of the cross, pick up your cross 
daily and follow me. And it is the way of the cross that allows you to progress through the temple paradigms, if you will, through onto maturity. And unless we're willing to every single day allow our flesh to be crucified, not obliterating your personality, but sanctifying it and purifying it so that it is surrendered in obedience to Christ. That is the way, if you will, um, to Christ. So, okay. So the first misconception is that uh, they're not labels to judge Christians, right? That these are conditions that we need to recognize that we are growing into maturity and we can all possess them in every day of, the, of, of, of our lives. The second one is that the word of God divides. We shouldn't. So Je- mm, Jesus, came, Jesus came not to that's bring huge. peace, but to bring a sword, right? That's Matthew 10, 34 through 39. And the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, by the way, uh, is sharper than any two-edged sword that can divide between soul and spirit. That's Hebrews 4, 12. So when we proclaim the truth, it brings a division within us, but it also brings a division without us, right? It like, it separates families and it also separates us, but it's Christ doing it, that. not us. Please go for I it. I talk about that. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ walks into ancient Palestine and announces that he's going to bring a sword. Wait, Jesus Christ walks in from the halfway point of Israel at the Jordan river and literally divides as he walks in, he literally divides the nation in half. He is the division. <laughs> so when the scriptures say the word of God divides soul and spirit, okay. God wants to know what's Christ in us and what's not Christ in us. And, and if I'm unwilling to go on a journey with the Holy Spirit to take that sword into my land, my land, and let God, through Jesus Christ himself, divide that which is him and not him, I'm going to resist him. And there's different kinds of resisting him, which these, you know, the carnal and the cultural and the, you know, these are ways that I can resist him, right? But if I'm going to be honest, God's asking me, what's Christ and, and what's not. So mm-hmm. it's not on me then. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back to something you did that you acknowledged in your response as you read the comments. If I'm going to look at another brother and I'm going to use any kind of knowledge about the gradations of Christianity to tear people down, judge them or determine that I'm doing well. If I want the mind of Christ, you think that's how the mind of Christ thinks about his sheep? Mm-hmm. So you tell me, brother man, where's Christ in your reaction as you understand that there are gradations within the Christian journey? Yeah. And unless, as you said earlier about reading through the comments, unless there's a weeping. <laughs> yeah, amen. You're going to have all these cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11. You want to join the cloud <laughs> of witnesses who are cheering people on? Where's your cheering mm-hmm. people on? Yeah. Where's your cheering people on? Where is your desiring that other people come up and in and out of religiosity, out of culture, out of self, cheering them on, praying for, crying, weeping, desiring? If yeah. that doesn't exist, then don't put yourself in the spiritual camp, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I can go all day long about the grief of people that were self-proclaiming, you know, that they were in one camp or the other and or challenging me that I was... I even brought up the fact that there is possibly distinctions and or signs of various areas of maturity, which is interesting. They're like, you're not allowed. There's no different types of Christians. So clearly you're not one. I'm like, well, didn't you just, 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 just <laughs> didn't you just do what you said I shouldn't do? <laughs> clearly you're not in, you're out. I'm like, that's a distinction. You know, <laughs> that, that is a line uh, based off of a couple words, like a 60 second video. Anyway, going off of that. Yeah. So here's the thing. So the word, and Matt, what you said was just powerfully yes and amen. 
Um, so the word of God, right, divides within us and without us. It divides us against other people, and it also divides us what is Christ in us and what is not Christ in us. We talked about that, about that a lot in the last video. We'll link that here or, or here, wherever, um, where we actually talked a lot about like First Corinthians 3, what is what's double hay straw, what is precious metals, and how do we build with that and what's going on. Um, but there's also... So there's no distinction in regard to salvation because like salvation's for everybody and it's Christ in us. Um, but Jesus did bring distinctions in order to, in people to expose light and darkness and holy and profane and constantly call us to be separate, pulled away. That's what holy means, right? To be separate from, to be distinguished from. Um, Leviticus 10.10, 10, uh, as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, between the unclean and the clean. And then Ezekiel twenty two twenty six. her priests do violence to my instruction and profane my holy things. Now, what does profane mean? Very quickly, profane is just making something that is supposed to be holy and set apart and make it common. And you profane it by making it less significant, by making it a kind of like uh, if you're married, you might hear... <laughs> Like, don't take your wife for granted. Don't take your spouse for granted. Just treating me like one of your friends. I'm not one of your friends. Has anyone ever heard that? I've never heard that. <laughs> but, but you're supposed you, to treat your wife as separate forget, and holy and special. When, when you forget your, your anniversary, you have profaned your you have profaned. You have made it like you it's did not hold Tuesday. this in regard. <laughs> it's not just Tuesday, man. Exactly. exactly. Um, okay. So. Here, so her priests do violence, right? By profaning the holy things, by just treating them like they're regular, commonplace, you know, normal things. They make no distinction between the holy and the common. And they do not explain the difference between the clean and the unclean. They disregard my Sabbath and I am profaned among them. And so this is what the distinguishing, this is what the piercing of the sword is doing. And what we're supposed to, that's why we're even talking about this, is we're just basically shining up a mirror saying, hey, guys, this is scripture. There seems to be these conditions of the heart and all throughout the prophets. What are they saying? Even though you are participating in all of these rituals, God says, I'm sick of them. Why? Because they're void of true spiritual worship which is, Romans tells us, your living sacrifice. You are putting sacrifices on the altar, but you're not putting yourself on the altar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with an objection before we can carry on too much forward. Um, just, you know, you're going to hear Dan and I a lot talking about um, things that sound like we're discussing the Jewish worship system. And, and it's going to create the question of, well, I thought we were New Testament Christians or isn't that old covenant or, or, or it's like, yeah, man, we're, we're all Jews and we should all start speaking Hebrew to each other in church. Okay. Here's the thing. I just read that first Corinthians 10 passage, right? The old Testament is filled with the, ne the necess the necessary language that the new Testament writers then use to train Christians. So guess which Bible Paul taught out of, right? He taught out of the Torah, you know, the, 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 three, the three divisions. So what we are attempting to do is to say what Jesus said in Luke 24, which is by taking the law of the prophets and the writings, you can explain Christ. And so they use terms like defiled, holy in the New Testament. They use terms like profane in the New Testament. You read Hebrews, it's filled with a very important point, which is the temple, right? This is the bottom point. We'll get back to our, our list here. The temple was not Jewish. The temple was in heaven. And it was eternal. And it happened before Moses. And it happened before Abraham. And it happened before Adam. Because the first thing that I would argue that God made when he made creation, was a throne. Right? An eternal throne. And then how do you relate to God, that eternal throne? The golden altar. And who gets to minister there? The priests. So guess what the New Testament is filled with? It's filled with priestly language, calling us priests. And then in Revelation 1 and 5, I'm just kind of hitting this objection hard, aren't I, Dan? 
when you get to Revelation 1 and 5, it says that Jesus Christ did all this blood work so that he could get a kingdom of priests. It says it twice in Revelation, right? So the end game of this thing is that we learn what it means to become priests. And yet we need to know the terms. We need to know how these things work. We need to understand the mechanics. So no, we're not sacrificing uh, physical lambs anymore. But Jesus entered into a heavenly temple to offer his own lamb's blood on our behalf. And we need to learn how the mechanics of that work to be able to relate to this being. Yeah. Yeah. I think because the language is obscure and, or seems like that's archaic or, you know, we, we fail to recognize that these were all figures and types to help us understand the spiritual reality. Right. And what is it? Colossians, like everything that is seen is made of things that are invisible. Like we need to recognize that, that the spiritual reality and substance of life is more real. It's hyper real than our lived experience, which is what it's going to decay and die. And what does he say? Like keep your treasures in heaven where things don't decay Mm -hmm. and die, which means that these are more sure and more real and more substantive. And so when you're getting a physical picture of a spiritual reality, we dismiss it like, Oh, that's just kind of (laughs) whatever. No, you need to pay strong attention because that's actually what we should be putting more weight into and matt and i are going to mm-hmm. deal very heavily on the temples when we have time like and subscribe and support us so that we can get to that <laughs> um also i will say that though there are i'm looking at my notes here and there are so many scriptures that we're not touching and covering on these notes but anyone that does subscribe to our patreon um they will get this entire list um so that you can see point by point all the scriptures that are informing this conversation um and we hope that blesses you guys so we talked about uh these are not labels to judge christians that's misconception one misconception two is that the word of god divides we should not but we should teach between holy and profane the third misconception is that this list is not who is saved and not saved. And that was a really uh, divisive point. Um, I would argue that the list is talking about stages of sanctification and or obstacles to overcome in the sanctification process. Now there is that distinction of cultural Christian versus carnal, right? That very first one of cultural Christians aren't actually Christians. They just go along with the motions. Um, I would beg. And, and again, do I make that distinction? No, I would say that there in the spirit, there is some discernment as you're talking with somebody, whether or not they care about the things of God or not. And, um, and we surrender those to people, but we all know, um, that you can call yourself a Christian and, and not even think twice about God ever because you grew up in a Christian household. Right. And so that's I'm, the only I'm, thing where I'm I'll s- say sanctification. Now. I'm sending the siren. I'm sending yeah. the siren, Dan. <laughs> Go for it. Um, if, if I'm in the Christian and I'm not born again, wouldn't it be nice to know? <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> like so much of this turns into so much of what we're talking about here turns into uh, you're, you're being good. judgy, you're being critical, you're being, yeah, but what if you're not saved? <laughs> Amen. Wouldn't you want someone to tell you? If you were just to see like, like the, like the, the people, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things? And he says, I don't even know who you are. Like, wouldn't it have been nice <laughs> like, that out ahead of time? <laughs> like to not wait until you show up and you're like, Oh, this is embarrassing. You know, that's all yeah, I'm saying. Like this is an amazing point. Be, we found something that now everyone needs to find out how right we are. No, don't yeah. you want this? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's really good. That's re- I'll actually say one of my closest friends, one of my closest friends of like 15 years, um, he thought he was a cultural Christian. And he thought that he was totally, because he knew the scriptures and he showed up to church on Sunday. He also slept with a lot of women from church after church on Sundays. But man, did he think that he was in until another very close friend of mine confronted him and said, don't you dare step into our service again while you're taking our girls out and sleeping with them kind of thing. And just lovingly rebuked him. I mean, hard rebuke, but in a spirit of love, but also protection for his spiritual sisters. But that rebuke of, dude, you're not a Christian and you are not walking with God because you have no remorse and you have no concept. And I don't care if you know the scriptures and that you grew up in church. And that is his testimony of, and I woke up and I realized, ah, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, thank you for correcting me. I, and he started taking God seriously and he repented and his life is transformed. Now it's got a beautiful family and mm. all these things. Right. And so, yes, thank you so much for bringing that up. Like 
Chuck Misler, who passed away some years ago, and I, I, I'm very indebted to that man's teaching, but he used to very often say in his sermons or his teachings, the only sure barrier to truth is, a, is the presupposition that you already have it. Wow. It's this posture we take. <clears throat> Let me say that again. The only sure barrier to truth is the presupposition that you already have it. It takes That's on this right. posture of humility to say, God, may I rethink upon my own thinking, which is the definition of repentance, and to say, show me where I could be wrong and, and let me hold everything, even the things that I've been deeply convinced of, I know I can grow more in my understanding of those things. So it's always surrendering it with an open heart saying, God, again, show me where I'm wrong. Dallas Willard mm. famously said, I always assume that half of everything I know is wrong. And it's just, we need to, again, come to come with this as, as, as a way to learn rather than to always preach. Go for it, Matt. I'm going to bounce off of that, which is to say, I think that's what I think that's what gave you and I so much spark to even go down this podcast road, which was when we started being presented with the opportunity to reinterpret Christianity around Christ, to reinterpret salvation around Christ, to reinterpret the end of the age around Christ, to reinterpret growth around Christ, to reinterpret church around Christ, not mission. What? That that it actually increased the love and the desire for Christ to inherit that thing. Right. And, and, and that's, I think that's the big, the big point is that the correction that I think that we have felt and that we're trying to pass along is not judgmental. It's life giving that around Christ, there's been decay according to the mode with which we will become completed. And Paul dealt with it with the Galatian church when he said, you guys have begun by the Spirit. Are you going to be perfected some other way? And I think there's too much of the being perfected some other way that has crept in. And I think that this list of four Christians demonstrate that there is a perfection stage that we must go through to. <laughs> But it's going to be the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit of Christ that actually moves us into the further progresses. I'm just taking every chance. Yeah, well, and you you had some, you, you definitely challenged me with the concept of perfection and with the concept of maturity. Like, what does that really mean to be perfect and complete? Um and I'm, we need to, I'm, I'll say that we need to have a whole conversation just on that. And that'll be another, another video for another time. And that I will say that's not arguing for, for moral and sinless perfection. Cause I would say there's some very dangerous cults that promote this type of like, you know, Nirvana perfection state. And, and, uh, I've, I've interacted with some of those and, and they're not of Christ. Um, they're mixed. At least they're at best, they're heavily mixed. So that's not, that's not what we say when we're like, Oh, there's this perfection. Yeah. However, spiritually speaking, there is a, there is a standard guys, like Christ is the standard and it's nothing full of grace. And that's what we're proclaiming here is that we don't do it, not by strength or by might Zechariah, but by my spirit. Right. And so it's like, it's this process of, mm. As I've as I've quickly described it to Matt, like I, I view perfection and completion as the lack of mixture. Of can I be so fully consecrated and surrendered that there is an ever flowing flow of the Spirit? Uh, probably not this side of heaven, but by golly, that's the goal, and I'll always be working at it. Um, okay, so back to this third point. This is not a list of the uh, who's saved or not saved. Um, yeah hopefully someone will tell us we need to be born again. And I think the church Christian church could do a great service to itself to, for people to really question, have I been born again? And I will quickly say, if you've never experienced a transforming work of Christ in your life, if you've never really overcome sin, if you don't seem to have power to live the Christian life, you might just want but, to say, God, but Dan, God, have I received your spirit? But Dan, am I being rude? I can do miracles. <laughs> I can do miracles. Oh. I've done miracles. Yeah. yeah. Gifts. Gifts versus salvation are not the same thing, right? The thing that we've got to remember is in First, Second Thessalonians 2, there's a man coming to this world 
and he's going to be able to do miracles. And the reality is so much of what a half of the Western um, religious system has developed that has defined salvation and relationship is equal to your measure of power. That unfortunately, you, if you were to walk into witchcraft school, they have, they have, they have power and they can read minds and they can pass along supernatural information. They can give people birthdays. They can give people, you know, Words secret of information. And, well, this is not knowledge. just witchcraft, the new age, new age movements, huge on astral projections and, and all kinds Reiki of Reiki healing, Reiki yeah. healing. Yeah. I healed in the power of the name of Jesus. Of Jesus. <sighs> Did you know it's possible to not? Right? So there's discernments that need to be entered in because otherwise these unsaved, we're talking about Christians who think they're saved. Otherwise, I can be an unsaved person schooled in the religion of Christianity. Can I hear that? I can get schooled in the religion of Christianity that will affirm my belief that I'm born again. And, and if we're going to say that that's not happening, I'm going to say naivety. <laughs> that's happening. But in order for us to complete what we want to do, Dan, we want to see Christ get a body of people who can uniformly, um, unitedly manifest one man. We can't get mixed up in what's soul power, witchcraft power, that is taking away our right to the blood of Christ and not being born again. Yeah. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when I say the power to overcome sin and have you ever experienced, that has nothing to do with gifts. Like when I, um, yeah. you know, I grew up in this, we, we, we grew up in the cessationist church, right. And start using some more charismatic terms and people, and I'm like, I'm trying to seek after God and seek after the spirit. People immediately think like, or are you just trying to operate in gifts? And it's like, no, I'm, I actually can care less. I, I, no, excuse me. I don't care less because I think that if God gave us gifts, they shouldn't be despised and that we should actively embrace them because he gave them to us to build up his body so that we can give him what he is after, which is a bride who has been made ready to marry him at the end of the age. Like, we need those gifts and we need to be functioning them with maturity and humility and, 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 and all of that. Um, but no, I think the work that it's talking about is, is like the true born again um, um, encounter and, and, and experience with Christ. The reality is if you've truly sat in the presence of Christ, you should not leave unchanged to whatever degree and measure. Like even in some of our prayers that we have before these calls, like there is a tangible and and weight of glory in various measures and degrees that we experience and we feel and we have mm -hmm. confidence to say the lord is with us we wouldn't be here if we didn't believe that we were, were that the lord was with us if and trust me when i say like we've been terrified at the idea of trying to do something that god is not building with us because if god if the, if the lord's not building it we labor in vain and so I think that's the, that's the distinction yeah. is, is if, if, if you're, and again, if you're questioning that, cause I've talked to Christians or it's just like, I don't know, I've never really had any experience. I don't know. I've just always done this. Those are the times it's like, well, then you need to wrestle with God, wrestle with God to say, God, show me who you are, reveal yourself to me. And like, this isn't a one-time thing. I still pray this every day. God, continue to reveal yourself to me, continue to show yourself in your scriptures in community good. and in our own private good, time. good stuff. No, I, I want to build off that. When when I'm being corrected, right? When when the Holy Spirit is retooling Christ in me, when the Holy Spirit is revealing that which is in me which is not Christ, that's my affirmation. That's my affirmation that I'm saved. If, if all I'm doing is walking through a day or a week looking at my good deeds or my power encounters or my ministry of the words I gave to people or the teachings I brought or the opportunities I had to do outbound works, but I'm not looking at the Father fathering me, this is sonship. This can be hireling. <laughs> 
I want to be a son of the Father. You know, I want to walk in a, a relationship that the Son has with the Father, and I want the Holy Spirit to train me in how to have a relationship with the Son in me. Doing these things is not at all an affirmation of anything except things are being done. That's all that's happening here. And, and praise God if they are. But that's not what we're talking about here. That's not what we're spending our podcast time. It's, this is not what God's looking to inherit. If God wants a miracle done, he's the miracle worker. If God wants a work done, his angels are faster and more powerful than me. What God needs, Romans 8, is the revelation of the sons of God. The revelation of a quality of relationship and a quality of submission in a people who have come into Christ and will then bear that image. There's nothing you can do to get that done. You become it. You become it. And without a focus on the becoming, uh, uh, the image, the image of Christ stamped in me, the Christ in me, that hope that there's a glory that God will get out of me. This is the origin of the phrase, all of our works are unrighteous. This is the origin of that phrase. We've got things we got to do. You should take care of your neighbor. You should take care of the orphans. You should take care of the widows. You should take care of the poor Christians. You should be doing this. But what? But the doing has nothing to do with the being, the becoming. I think that's what we're here trying to divide, right? We need this box really, really strongly represented again, or else we are going to keep doing this hamster wheel thing that is only going nowhere. Yeah. Everything that God does in his spirit, Satan counterfeits. And so, yeah. And we can be gravely deceived. And I think that's what Matt was saying. Like we can be deeply deceived by the counterfeits of the miraculous and, and many will be taken away in those times because they're looking for the power versus the inward source of the spirit. Um, yeah, I'm going to let that be. That's good. Um, so yeah, so we're talking, so that's, so, that, so, so this isn't talking about who's saved and who's not, right? And there are those distinctions and we need to make that. But in the sanctification process, um, there is various levels, I don't want to say levels, but there's various, there's maturity, there's life to life. We go from, from glory to glory, from life to life, from knowing to knowing, right? From faith to faith. Um, there, we are continually progressing in our spiritual journey as we pursue God. And in that process, God is revealing to us other um, affections in our hearts that we are also pursuing because God wants undivided devotion. Just like when you say yes to your spouse, you are saying no to every other potential spouse. The problem is spiritually, your affections and the things you pursue are all muddled and mixed. And God is slowly wanting to delineate between those and say, hey, trust me, trust me. And um, I think Matt and I can attest to how profoundly surprised we were to see how much every single day to this day is competing for our affections and our desires for Christ alone. Um, and that's the battle every day is every day I wake up and there are new affections and there are new desires that are competing for my affection and devotion to Christ. And those all need to be properly subdued and surrendered and yielded to Christ to say, Lord, your will be done, not my own. Um, so sanctification is this process where we're cooperating with Christ in our training and discipline. That's what the Holy Spirit is given. That's going to be a whole nother conversation that this Holy Spirit, yes, given to like to dispense gifts to build up the body. That's one aspect of the Holy Spirit. He is also um, given as the assurance of our salvation, praise God, being born again with the Spirit inside of us. Um, he is also the child trainer uh, to turn us into sons. And that is a huge, grossly like misunderstood and misrepresented aspect of what the Holy Spirit was truly given in his capacity and role in our lives, that we are supposed to be submitted to the spirit within us so that he can discipline and correct and train us into sonship. Um, I'm sure those are some terms that some may know others might not fully understand what sonship and all it is. 
time a tale for another day. Um, but anyway, he writes the words on our hearts, right? But it, it's Jesus at the end of the day. Jesus is the one that divides between sinner and saint. Jesus is the one that divides between goat and sheep. We're not supposed to do that. In fact, there are two specific parables where he tells us not to do that. We have the the parable of the tares and the pairs of the dragnet, both in Matthew 13, where the disciples are like, should we rip, you know, like in the, in the thing, they're like, should we rip up the wheat and should we divide? And he goes, no, 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 no. If you rip up the, the, the weeds, you're going to tear up good, good wheat as well. Like let them grow together. And then at the end of the age, then they'll be separated by the one that knows how to separate them. Why also? Because they're still in process. They are still in process. And and by God's grace, we're continually praying for our own sanctification and for the salvation of others and for everybody to come from immaturity to maturity. And we need to be supportive and speak the truth in love for all of us to contend in the faith for, for oneness together. And if there's not oneness, so whether someone thinks they're Christian and they're not really, and you kind of secretly know, but you're wooing them, either way, it's just you're challenging them to come into Christ. It's not, hey, I need you to do more things. It's just, do you love Christ or are you divided in your devotion? That message goes for someone that doesn't love Christ and doesn't com- like claim to love Christ or someone that claims and, and has been doing this their whole life. Either way, it's, are there other affections competing for your devotion to him? And the answer will always and should be, yes. How willing are you to crucify that? I think that's the message for an unbeliever or for a believer. How willing are you to surrender to Christ if you're assured of his love and goodness? And the love and goodness of God is another one we can talk about. But So only God knows the motivations of our heart. And we are called to build up one another and admonish and rebuke. That's that's Hebrews and that's 1 Thessalonians. Hebrews 3 and 1 Thessalonians, right? We're called to, 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 to correct each other and to challenge each other. And I think that's that's a lot of what even this message does and why it's so offensive is because it, it kind of poked at some of those things. Any final thoughts on that, Matt, before we go to the uh, fourth point here? No, it's good, Dan. Um, yeah, I guess that's that at the end of the day, that's that's what stirs me up on this topic, which is um, we're, we're not going to cross the finish line alone and be pleasing to the Father. And so, so much of this categorization question and topic feeds individuality, but what it's supposed to do is feed mutuality. Right? Like, there, partly it's our, our, our Western cultural dynamic which, which individualizes everything, right? And then we add clubs and committees and, and, and community to my individuality. But since Jesus' end goal is a body of people, one with the head, since the end goal is a temple of living stones built together, transparently shining together, built on the row of apostles and prophets, Christ is the cornerstone. There's this necessity that I not be content with, well, I'm good, sucks to be my brother. You know, this, all of this talk is supposed to try to build the mutuality of being concerned for our brother, right? Being concerned for the state and the status of his soul and my soul and then laboring you know we, we always go quick to words but going to the throne of god and saying god like deal with me first deal with my specs or my logs deal with my logs deal with my logs deal with my logs deal with my logs and then god will assign us maybe perhaps opportunity to deal with specs of brother but it's because God wants a group of people who will first John love one another, love one another. And I think our version of Christianity in the West has for so long been allowed to individualize your performance and your relationship with God on an individual basis that it's preventing Christ from inheriting the body of people who will love each other in such a dynamic that the truth can reign among them and everybody can go up together to completion. Solo, solo Christians crossing the finish line. God, God bless you for making it, but God wants you to have somebody, somebody else that you've locked arms with 
and drug each other across the finish line together by the grace of God. Yeah. Yeah. The absolute need for community and for church, for oneness, um, that deserves its own conversation because that is grossly under misunderstood and the individualistic Christian that, that spirit needs to die. Like it need we, we need to recognize how, how, if, if you think that I don't need the church or it's just me and it's you and it's, and I'm good, you don't understand God's heart. Because if you truly loved God, you'd love what he loves and he loves his church and his church is the body of people. Um, and you grossly misunderstand his eternal purpose of what it is that he has been doing everything to accomplish and to achieve, which is not a bunch of saved individuals, but a family, a body, a unified bride. Um, I'll, I'll get myself in trouble if I go down that li- that road any any further. No, I, I'm going to help it. I'm going to help it. I'm just going to help it. I just want to say, like, whenever Dan and I are saying something that sounds, you know, judgmental, sounds corrective, that sounds, oh, we're not doing something good enough or something as a church in the West or whatever. Here's the deal. Jesus deserves the end goal. He deserves it. He deserves your soul and my soul working out the life of Christ together. He deserves it. And when it's not happening in any way, someone's someone's always got to be qualified to be able to say, we're not able to achieve the final goal if we keep this with us. And, and the individuality thing is a huge thing that needs to get kicked. Yeah. Well, that's going to lead me into the fourth point. And there's one more after that. Um, and that's don't allow a spirit of condemnation. Ooh, um, that's good. That's good. That's so the more soulish you are, so we're physical, soulish, spiritual. Okay. Um, body, body, soul, spirit. spirit. The more soulish you are, meaning you're operating in your mind, your will, and your emotions, and that's like the source of your life, um, the more threatened you're going to be by spiritual language because the the spirit is opposed to the flesh. <laughs> like that is spirit, spirit as defined as Christ, right? It's, yeah, and I don't mind saying that, you know, I'm just saying, I just want to, for the sake of the, you know, but you keep going, you keep using the term, I'm just saying. So, but the soul, Cry, like it craves life. It, it craves to be in dominance. Again, they're, they're fighting for superiority. And that's the whole, that's, I mean, that's the secret between the, the parable of Jesus and the, and the, and the grain of wheat that goes into the earth and dies. There is life inside the seed, but unless the seed goes in the earth and that hard exterior shell dissolves and dies and cracks for that seed of life, It'll never give forth to the abundance that's within it, the, the tree that can then provide shade and oxygen and food to the world. You hear that? For it to bear any type of life, you in that hard exterior shell of your soul that is keeping, if you will, the spirit suppressed, which is, by the way, every fiery dart of the enemy is aimed at keeping that shell hard. Every fiery dart of the enemy is aimed at suppressing the life of Christ inside of you. And it'll do that through religion, and it'll do that through good works, and it'll do that through doctrines, and it'll do that through sin. It'll do it through every means possible as long as Christ is not released. It'll release your soul. It'll give you gifts, like Matt was saying. It'll counterfeit every supernatural phenomenon it can to make you feel a little warm fuzzies. It'll give you everything you need as long as Christ's life is not actually released. But when you go down and die in that earth and you crack open and you allow the spirit to go, that's when Christ gets what he's after and his life is released. And um, when his life is expressed and not suppressed. And so when you are operating in the soul and you're a very soulish individual and you're very adamant about that. Again, the spiritual language would be threatening. What was interesting to me is from early on in my, in my Christian faith, I always loved the messages that confronted me the most. 
because I appreciated the correction because it drives me nuts that there could be something hindering my growth in Christ. And so when someone exposed something within me that I either wasn't aware of, that I was avoiding, or that was hindering me, even though it hurt, I mean, gosh, like, thank you. Like, thank you. Like, there was a spirit of gratitude to be like, I'm so thankful you're pointing this out. Holy cow, do I need this? I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to wrestle with it. I'm going to sit with God with it. I'm going to cry. I'm going to weep. I'm going to whatever. But I'm going to thank him mm-hmm. that he exposed this because when the light shines, yes, it shows you your darkness. And so sometimes when we see an exposure of our sin, we think we're doing worse when actually it's the grace of God because that means light shining and you can see. And it's what you do in that moment of, okay, are you going to now cover it up and hide? Or are you going to praise God, reveal it, and allow it to be manifested in the light? Like, okay, God, like, let's deal with this. Let's get rid of it. And let's press on toward the upward call of mm. Christ. Um, That's good. So if you're being threatened yeah. by this, I'm sorry. But again, use that as a case to say, okay, maybe there's something here. Um, because if Christ is being revealed and and what's not him is being removed we should rejoice even if it's within the, especially when it's within you well i had this this week dan i had this this week is um i was i was presented last weekend with a, a coincidence right a coincidence is an a and a b right or an a and an a and <clears throat> the coincidence was along the lines of me needing to acknowledge that my strong mindedness needed to be addressed in the spirit and I felt resistance, even though I acknowledged that it was something not resistible. <laughs> I acknowledge it's true, but I felt a resistance. My soul, my literal soul itself, suddenly got the light shone on it. And it didn't want me to go down the path of exploring my strong-mindedness. And I felt discomfort. <laughs> It felt a soul burp welling up from within that didn't want me to go down the path of shining more light on it, right? But now here at this point, I'm too, I'm in too deep. I'm like, oh, well, now I have to go down that path. (laughs) And so then the next coincidence was, was I was, I was skimming through YouTube looking for a particular, uh, 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 message series that I was expecting to find. And I saw an old one that I hadn't finished and there was like 10 minutes left. You know how YouTube shows that red line of, of what you've watched. So I like just tap it. I mean, there wasn't even a title that was intriguing to me. It was just, you know, so I just tap it and the guy is instantly talking about how to deal with your strong mind. That was exactly what was being talked about there. Okay. Coincidence? I think not. And so, but that's my point is our soul, forget about demons for a minute. Forget about spirits for a second. We know, our conscience knows when Christ is being presented and I'm supposed to say yes, but it's going to cost my soul something. My conscience knows, my soul knows when it's being threatened by Christ. And it then turns my mind into an objection factory or a runaway factory so that I can get away from the discomfort and go back to feeling good about my self-righteousness. It's literally what's happening. What we're talking about is, is being trained and retrained to recognize that and say, no, when Christ is presented as your life, when Christ is presented as your mind, the Christian alternative is Christ in you, glorifying himself, and you feel resistance, I have a resistance, then you go back to the basics, which is what Dan and I want to talk a whole lot about, is the crucified life, is recognizing, no, we need to address that. Christ needs to come in and replace my strong mind with his mind, my strong soul with his nature, and that using those clues, we can avoid condemnation, but conviction can work its full capacity in my life. Amen. That's so good. And that's, you said that's the flesh side of things like remove the spiritual component. I'll add the spiritual component in a very brief way to make things less spooky, spiritual warfare, which is something that, you know, is intriguing to me. And I came to Christ 
through the, kind of a funky experience. And so it's, it's been one that I've wanted to understand because I recognize there's things other than just me at play here. Um, but the best way to understand spiritual warfare is that it's in the mind. Primarily, that's, that's where good. you're fighting it. You're fighting it in that's the mind. Good. You're not you're not doing weird exercising things. And sure, some of that has its place. And I will say that some of it. But majority of especially what we're going to deal with in our secular humanistic worldview here in the West is it's in your mind. And s- there are spiritual strongholds, which are systems of thoughts and beliefs that the enemies has constructed to keep you bogged down that you need to deconstruct and then reconstruct in the proper framework of Christ and his word. Um, and just so you know, Matt and I base everything off the word of God. We don't come to conclusions because we sit back and go, Oh, you know, that'd be kind of, it's like, no, we, we diligently examine the scriptures, not doctrines and theologies. Although sometimes I consult those because I'm curious what's going on, but for the most part, it's scripture. And then everything else comes in into order under that. Um, and so that's the same thing. So if you're feeling, and so, okay, but also uh, systems of thoughts and belief that do lead to very strong emotions that can be counterfeited as spiritual conviction. So there should be spiritual conviction, not demonic condemnation. So if you're feeling shame and guilt because you're, you know, as you listen to the list or it, we're going to go through it two part, we're going to actually go through cultural, carnal, religious, and spiritual Christians. Um, we don't have time today, so that'll be our next episode. But um, we're going to get into that. And you might be hearing these lists and going, holy cow, I am cultural, or I am carnal, or I am religious, or and you're going to feel all this guilt and all this shame and all this condemnation. That is not of the Spirit of Christ. Conviction, yes, that leads to godly repentance, yes, where you would then renounce and then receive and then christ fills you with life and joy it's full of life and onward progression but if it makes you feel like you're sunk down and unworthy and all of these things that is ungodly demonic condemnation because he is an accuser of the brethren and he stands before the lord day and night accusing roaring lions trying to find someone to devour and we would say spiritually you absolutely oppose that in christ with the scriptures prayer and fasting, grab other people to intercede for you, whatever you need to do to get out of that posture as soon as possible and come into godly conviction that leads to repentance, life, joy, and peace. Honestly, the moment I confess my sins, there is an immediate, like Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress, when he came before the cross and the burden falls off of his back, like the moment I repent sometimes and I openly confess, I I still deal with consequences. Don't get me wrong. And there's, there's whatever emotions are, but man, the guilt and all of that spiritual weight, you're free. There should be that release and that freedom and that peace that comes with God. Thank you for exposing this. Now, may I repent and pursue. Now I will counter I will counter that and say, um, or you can respond by hardening your conscience and suppressing it. And and wallowing in your sin and 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 babying your sin and 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 uh, coveting your sin and you're going to sear your conscience and you're going to continually grow doler and doler and doler. Um, and Hebrews talks about that, like the, the very dangers of um, of, a, of a, in Romans as well of a seared con- Romans what what one to three talks about a seared conscience and and the issues with that. But uh, Hebrews also talks about how we're supposed to encourage one another. Um, day after day, as long as a day is day, so that we're not deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. Um, yeah. And and this this will I I did write a whole other thing that Matt and I can talk about um, the, in in regards to a fear of condemnation. If you are feeling very triggered by some of this language, especially as we the next episode as we get into the actual descriptions, the difference between fear and faith, and mm-hmm. this really got triggered, and I think. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna intro it, and then we're gonna do a whole a whole a whole conversation about it. But holy cow, this is a huge revelation for me, and it got triggered because of this uh, of the the viral post. Sadly, I believe the foundation for many people who genuinely love the Lord and are probably born again, the foundation is fear and not faith. What I mean is that you ran to God because you were afraid of hell or whatever. And so granted that introduced you to a relationship with him and you praise God for the salvation, but then everything else gets built on fear. And so we then 
there are those who build entire theological constructs and get very strong in theology and doctrines. Why? Because they provide a level of security of, I know the answers. And when someone comes in and pokes at your theological construct that provides you safety and security, because you know the answers and they're hard and black and white, you, not only are you offended because you were wrong and no one likes to be wrong, but now you're terrified because that was, that was the foundation you were standing on for your assurance. It wasn't a relationship in faith in Christ. It was a, a fear-based reliance on a system of thought and belief, which is a stronghold. And now I'm not to say that theology and doctrines and denominations are bad. I'm not, I'm not going down that road right now. I am the beneficiary of the works of the saints, and I love reading the, the men and women of old that have that we are standing on the shoulders of to see anything. I think the only reason that we're at the conclusions we are in the conversations we are now in the church is because of all the work that was dil- diligently labored for us to, to benefit from. But our foundation of faith needs to be in our relationship with Christ and him alone. And when that takes place, you're not, I mean, you, you'll contend in the conversations and you'll be passionate and care about things. But the fear and the animosity that took place in the comment section was so devastating. And it pointed out to me, I'm like, I think people are terrified that, that their theological construct doesn't fit with what we're talking about here um, because it's what they base their yeah. salvation on or the relationship. Yeah. Which, which kind of is a nice inclusio for our time here today, which is to say, you know, why was there such a reaction to that 60 second post? And you just, you just, you know, you just defined probably why there was the great reaction because the reality is when, when I, as a saint, when you, as a saint, when we, when we have come into a relationship with Christ and he's been able to communicate himself to me, and he can communicate with me, right? Scriptures and spirit. I find that the Proverbs become true. And the Proverbs want me to go on a, on, on a search for wisdom. Colossians 2 defines that as the man, Jesus Christ. And then, and then it goes along and Proverbs says, he who hates correction is stupid. So that means I should expect to be corrected. If I'm entering into a relationship with a deity, right? We've, ha- we've hammered on correction so much today. I didn't really expect us to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's just go there. Let's just finish it. <clears throat> if I'm going to enter into a relationship with a deity without a birthday, and I think, I think he's the one who's going to adjust to me. <laughs> Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> come on, whatever, yeah. right? Like, I've only had gray hair for a few years, right? I got one. His hair is it's, it's white. Back, like it's wool. back here somewhere. Yeah. Oh, Dan, you got to get yourself some grays, man. Everybody's <laughs> doing it. Three kids are. I feel like they're going to come rapidly. I'm pretty tired, but. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the crow's feet come. So Uh, I should expect that my relationship with an all powerful almighty being who defined himself by (laughs) inserting deity into a female and producing a, a a new God, man, baby. (laughs) I'm the one who needs a lot of training and correction here. (laughs) I'm the one who's got to learn him. Yeah, <clears throat> And saying I've got him figured out, it does not absolve me of the fact that I don't got him figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, like there's a humility that comes in with all these things. Mm-hmm. And we're not asking everybody to, uh, to flush their past and to question everything they've ever said or done. That might come later. But, yeah. but we're, what we're saying here is, there's, there's a relationship in Christ that produces the end goal that the Father and the Son determined in eons mm-hmm. past. Yeah. And, and that determination and that relationship is laid out in Scripture. And mm-hmm. it has become buried because that eternal purpose is lost. Yeah. It needs to come back. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and if we took the, the highest view of Scripture, if we took the highest view of our understanding, if you were just to condense all of Scripture into one theme, we were with God, we fell away from Him, and we're being restored until we culminate into getting back to where we began. Not just where we began, but to enter into what never got entered into, that got disrupted. Exactly. New creation. Yeah. We New creation because there was something that Adam and Eve were supposed to do they never did. And we have the opportunity to get restored, and salvation is the process of us getting the entrance back into that process. The entrance, if you will, go back to the temple, the entrance into the temple. But then, as you were saying, we need to be – so the scriptures train us. How do you relate to this God, and how do you get back? It's a pretty intense process, and even if you know theologically the answers, and I'm sure a lot of people do, because we're not some Gnostics here trying to hang a carrot in front of you of some secret wisdom. No, we're reading the same Bible you guys are. Like <laughs> we don't have, we're not, we're not pulling out some sacred ancient books. Like it's it's the 66 books of Scripture. That's what we're base banking on here. So hopefully you have, but we can look at these same things and have eyes shielded. And even if you know all the answers, have you become the reality of it or are you becoming the reality of it? And that's the deceitfulness of sin. And, and there was two trees and we're really good at pointing out evil. But the reality is that the, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and I think that's where Matt and I, if we, if I was to kind of consolidate this into like the thing that we poke at the most is that Christianity is still – people who are Christians are still eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and basing their theological and religious constructs off of that versus the life of Christ, a whole another tree. We're still eating from the same stinking tree, and we've gotten really good at pointing out all the bad. And, and, and affirming the good. And it's like, it's still operating off of this intellectualism, off this distinction of good and evil. We're not supposed to be like, get to the tree of life yeah. and, yeah, and the be opposite done of, with all of this. Yeah. The opposite of the knowledge of good and evil was something very simple. Life. And I wish there was more words to convey what that means. And we're limited by words, but God has given us temple, body, and bride, and so many other concepts to help us grasp and understand this, this deep spiritual reality. Um, and what we're arguing for is outer court Christianity to, to enter into the inner court where the, the Holy, where the golden altar is in the Ark of the Covenant to, to become one with him. Um, the very last thing I'll say, because, oh my goodness, there's what, seven conversations I think we're having now that we had this, <laughs> that, we, that yeah. we need to have its own individual thing. Yeah. The last misconception of these five things is that this list, these types are deeply biblical. Um, and we don't have time to get into all of them, but I have 11 scriptures just on that alone. Galatians 5, 7, Galatians 5, 13, Romans 14, 12, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 5, Hebrews 6, 1. I can keep going. If you want that list, please consider subscribing to the Patreon where you're going to get this entire, um, download. You'll get also extended interviews, other things, um, like, and subscribe. Thank you so much for being here. We'll catch you soon.